Got it now. Wow. So how not to design software, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, hopefully it's going to work at this point. <laughs> so is it is the live stream working at least? So if that's working, then let's let's get started. Okay, so we're a bit late, but let's get started. Sorry about that. At some point we'll figure it out, but every time there's something different, slightly different. Okay, so today we'll continue uh, the discussion that we start on research. We'll continue on memory centric computing. But before I think we jump into this, hopefully people have seen the papers that we have assigned. So you got an email and you're looking over them and deciding how to prioritize. Are there any questions, thoughts? Okay, nothing at this point. Okay, let us know if, you, if there are any questions. Uh, yeah, let's see. I think, uh, I don't know when we will start the presentations, but probably sometime April. So you will have time actually. I think there are, uh, last time I looked, it was 14. Yeah, we should, yeah, we should be able to do, squeeze everything into seven days, but maybe we can relax them a little bit. Let's see. So, yeah. Yeah, one of the issues, I think our quota is exactly 22. Next semester, we'll probably increase that quota so that because some people drop, they're shopping around, right? And maybe some interest people don't get into class because of this. There's a, I mean, if people want to take the class, they can still take it, but maybe it's a bit late. Uh, well, it's not really late from our perspective, but it may be late from their perspective. Uh, yeah, that's the downside of these quotas and people shopping around, I think. Okay. If there are no questions, we can get started. But hopefully everybody who is still in class is very interested and we'll have a lot of good discussions. That's good. Okay, so, uh, okay. So I'm not gonna cover the slides that I've covered. Now you're not going to see the slides, so that's also a bit sad. Basically, you're not seeing the presenter view. Or can I go over the slides? Okay, so basically we were talking about memory-centric computing and these were one of the last slides that we discussed. Uh, we want to make computing architectures much more data-centric, uh, minimize data movement, enable computation with minimal data movement. That's good. And uh, essentially compute where it makes sense. And we were talking about processing in, inside memory just to remind you there are a lot of issues over here and some of the papers that we have looked at actually cover some of those issues. Maybe we'll choose some of those papers. And this is actually a very uh, open research area right now. Uh, how do we design the memory controllers, processors, communication units, software and hardware interfaces, programming languages, what are the different programming models for processing in memory? Or can you do it simply with existing programming models and modifying the compilers? Or do you want to extend the languages in some way? How do you design the system software to allocate the tasks, to provide quality of service, to enable concurrent access and concurrent computation inside memory? So there are a lot of interesting questions, I think. And algorithms and theoretical foundations are also quite interesting, uh, I think. I mean, if you're theory oriented, I think maybe theory folks also should be focusing on more data-centric computing paradigms as opposed to processor-centric computing paradigms. We discussed this last time, right? Okay, so I'll, I'll not harp on it, but I think I, I really feel there's a lot of uh, potential in the theory area here, uh, which is not really exploited. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it's really across the stack. Basically, if you're looking at processing inside memory or inside storage uh, or inside even caches, actually, that's also interesting, I think, although it's a limited uh, possibilities, right? If, you, if you're doing process, processing inside the caches, the possibilities are limited because the amount of data that you have in the caches is limited. Even though today's caches are becoming bigger, they're on the order of 30 to 64 gigabytes, still uh, not uh, for a, a terabyte, for example, uh, of memory. Or in, in, in the case of disks, you can have even larger, right? 16, 32, 64 terabytes, potentially. So there's a lot more data that you can store and compute on uh, as you go outside of the processor core today. So having everything, uh, uh, enabling everything, every possible component in the system to do computation on the data 
uh, that it stores is, I think, a very interesting propos pr uh, proposition. And that includes the caches, I think. Today, if, even if you look at the processor core and caches, they're decoupled from each other, right? Caches do not, cannot do computation. Uh, they, they have to send the data to the processor core so that uh, computation can be done. But there are savings that you can also get by doing processing inside the caches. Maybe they're not as big as what you would get if you do processing inside the memory or the storage over here. Okay. Any thoughts, questions? We can also make this a bit more of a discussion. Yes, please. Oh, okay, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, today, I don't know, uh, basically today, there's not much information, right, uh, that's provided. But over time, uh, I believe uh, people will provide this information, especially if uh, the operating system starts becoming responsible for task allocation, for example, uh, on the memory side. Uh, but, but basically today, uh, the way uh, processing and memory engines are used, they're accelerators. Uh, the operating system doesn't even get involved uh, as much. Uh, the programmer basically manages the processing and memory engine, right? They're, they're kind of primitive today, basically, if you think about it. GPUs were like that a long time ago. GPUs are still uh, not as well integrated, uh, but they're much better integrated today to the virtual memory system, for example. Yeah, but over time, I think uh, it's good to provide this information to the operating system uh, and certainly to the programming language as well, uh, so that people can decide easily or enable can be enabled to offload things easily. And the operating system can decide if there are multiple programs requesting this accelerator, how to prioritize, right? That's, that's an issue that not, actually, there are not that many works on that topic. Uh, we did some work on GPUs, for example, if you have GPUs that are capable of uh, processing in memory also, what kind of kernel should be offloaded. Uh, so in that case, of course, you need some information to be exposed uh, to the runtime system. Uh, and we also did some work where, which I will talk about actually, to understand what, off, what kind of functions benefit from offloading. But at the system level, uh, some decision maker can benefit from this. Any other questions? So basically, we don't have a lot of infrastructure to make this, let's say, seamless today. Right now, it's used as an accelerator mainly. OK, so I mentioned this paper. So uh, we're going to cover some of this paper uh, today. Uh, there's a lot more in this paper, actually, uh, that you may be interested in. You can take a look at it. Oh, it's really difficult to see when in this mode over here. It's very small. Oh, I can see much better over here. Uh, Let's see, what do I want to point out? Uh, so basically there, this, this part over here is a lot about, about a lot of research in my opinion. I mean, the other parts are also research, but enabling the adoption of PIM, what are the different issues like security considerations, virtual memory support, system support, things like what you mentioned. So there are a lot of issues uh, and there are a lot of research opportunities in this area. Of course, I think there are a lot of research opportunities in understanding like what kind of models are possible and what kind of applications could benefit. So I think all of this uh, area is really full of research opportunity right now. And today uh, you can do some of the research on real systems as well, because we have some real systems, as we discussed, OpMem system, for example, Samsung system, as well as Hynix's system. I will mention them again. Uh, but I think uh, we need to have two models. We need to think differently from past approaches. So past approaches, if you look at, I think some of the processing and memory papers, we actually uh, put on the list early ones. If you're so inclined, you can choose one of those papers from 1960s, 70s, and we can have a historical discussion potentially. Uh, but uh, some of those past approaches did not really consider these, uh, actually a lot of those past approaches did not really consider the adoption issues. Uh, and uh, as we discussed last time, maybe this idea was always until recently uh, ahead of its time, meaning uh, that it's what, we were not ready for these ideas, but today we're actually really squeezed in the middle. That's why you see these approaches that are, you see these, uh, processing in memory engines that are appearing. Did we discuss these two different approaches to processing in memory last time? Okay, so maybe we'll, we'll, we're at the right place here. So uh, I think there are two major approaches to processing in memory. I call both of them processing in memory uh, or computation in memory, uh, but I think the, the two are fundamentally different. So one is processing using memory, the other is processing near memory. Let me cover the second one first because second one is very similar to today's model, right? Today, what we have is a processor and the memory, they're far away from each other, right? Uh, processing near memory essentially means that put the processor closer to memory, such that at some point, it's potentially immersed inside the memory chip, right? Uh, so of course, how close you get determines uh, how bad your data movement 
is, right? Today, we're pretty far away. Memory is off chip, uh, processor is on chip, uh, processor is on its own die. So you have these huge interconnects that you need to go through. But the processor can be inside the memory controller. That's one step that you bypass the cache hierarchy. Uh, the processor or some sort of processor, right? It, it doesn't have to be the full general purpose processor. It could be an accelerator also. The processor could be uh, on the logic layer of 3D stacked memory die. The processor could be uh, on the board of a module, DRAM module, connected to many chips. We, we see examples of this actually. I think the, uh, where this idea becomes really, really interesting is where the, when the processor becomes inside the memory chip or uh, somehow bonded to the memory chip via 3D stacking, for example. Uh, that's why you really get a lot of benefit because you get rid of these big interconnects uh, between different chips. But that's the idea basically. So processing near memory is a little bit, in that sense, processing near memory is similar to today's models, right? It doesn't really change uh, the computation model that much. You still have processor, some sort of accelerator, some sort of instruction set. It can be an FPGA also, sure, yes, no question about that. Uh, but it's similar to what we're used to, uh, in my opinion. In that sense, its adoption is easier, in my opinion. And as a result, a lot of people are developing these processing near memory systems today. Uh, so that's what all of the processing near memory, uh, all of the processing in memory systems from real systems from Upmem, Samsung, and Hynix are. They're all near. Uh, they're they're all near bank systems actually. They all have processors near a bank, uh, so that they can have very fast access, very low latency uh, access to that bank, and energy efficient access to that bank. And all kinds of issues arise, of course. Right now, you have a processor next to a bank another processor next to a bank. You have a distributed system, basically. Uh, how do you partition your computation to maximize performance, energy efficiency, to take advantage of this accelerator uh, with many processors distributed across many banks, right? If you don't have very good connectivity between those banks, then your acceleration may not be uh, as good as you expected. Okay, so this is working still, I think. Mm. Okay, so we'll talk about processing near memory, and there are actually many, many papers written on processing near memory. Uh, and I think there needs to be many, many more works done to demonstrate the benefits. We're, we're especially going to talk about uh, different applications. And some of the papers actually, we have uh, also sprinkled into the list of papers. You may see them. Uh, but let's talk about processing using memory because I think this is fundamentally different. And it's, it requires a fundamentally different way of thinking in my opinion. But I think it's, as a result, it's, it's, it's longer term in my opinion. But hopefully it will also be enabled and it can enable much bigger parallelism, uh, again, in my opinion, as you will see from the numbers also. And the idea of this processing using memory is you don't have the notion of a processor, basically. You, the idea is you don't have design a separate processor. You have this memory that's designed as memory today, but this memory has, is actually capable of computation as well. So it has the, uh, the logic that you designed to act as memory is also capable of computation and data movement just because it's a logic circuit that can do some computation basically. And because of its operational principles. And the question is, can you use those operational principles to do uh, real computation and accelerate applications? Okay, so let's start with that one. Clearly this is a different way of thinking because uh, that's not what we think today, right? We don't think of memory as doing computation. You think of processor as doing computation, yes. And if you put processor close to memory, yes, we are still programming a processor, but we're not programming a processor the way we think about it today if we're using memory to do computation and not adding additional processors over there. Okay, so the, the paper actually discusses this. Uh, we, we need to update this actually to become even better, but we'll do that. So that's the idea of processing using memory. Take advantage of the operational principles of memory to perform bulk data movement and computation in memory. We're gonna start with data movement. And the idea is to exploit internal connectivity that you have in the memories to move data to copy data or initialize data. And you can also exploit analog computation capability. And many memories have this sort of analog computation capability actually. And we will see some of them. And you can also uh, uh, change the memory system, uh, memory chip a little bit so that you can do these things even better. Right? And we will discuss that also. So there are many examples of this, some of which are in your reading, some of which are not. Uh, I will start with some. And again, I'll give you a broad overview. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail on any of these ideas, but if you're interested, we can go into depth. Uh, if you go into detail on all of these ideas, then uh, this will become more like a computer architecture course, like some of you have taken, right? 
And we, we actually go into a lot of detail on these ideas when we take computer, I mean, in computer architecture. And so uh, the question is, of course, what functions can memory perform, right, without much modification based on its operational principle? And what, uh, one of those functions, or two of those functions, data copy and initialization. And this is actually used in many, many applications. Uh, clearly, you can imagine, for example, initializing a one terabyte database. It takes a lot of time. Or whenever you deallocate some memory, that memory needs to get initialized by the operating system to zero so that you don't leak any information. This, there's clearly privacy and security issues over there. Whenever you fork a process, you need to copy data uh, from the parent process to the child's space. Usually, it's done using copy on write whenever, you're, whenever the parents need to write. Uh, then at that point, the children needs to need to get the copies, clean copies, of course, not the updated copies. Uh, uh, yeah, essentially, there are many, many uh, applications of data copy and initialization. And this paper from Google that we talked about, ISCA 2015 paper, uh, they actually quantified the amount of time spent in different uh, functions in all of their data center workloads. And they found out that approximately 5% of the entire execution cycles of all of their data center workloads, according to them, is spent on these two function calls, memmove and memcopy. This is a bit amazing because these are just two function calls that do data copy. There could be other data copies in the system that don't go through these function calls clearly, uh, but the, only these two function calls account for 5% of execution cycles. That's a lot. So that's why these are important. So how do we do a copy today? I don't, uh, well, I don't have the slide to, since this is uh, borrowed from a talk that I usually give. But today what we do is if you want to copy one source page, let's say four kilobytes to another destination page, you go through the processor, right? You do loads and stores. You basically, you load the source page byte by byte all the way into the L1. You load the destination page, do the write. And then uh, at some point, the destination page gets written back to memory. So that's a lot of data moments. Uh, Imagine doing this for one terabyte, right? Uh, memory, you're, you're writing zeros to memory or some value to initialize to memory. Basically, it's a lot of data moment. You, source page goes in, destination page goes in, and destination page, written destination page goes out. Yes, yes. Yes, basically, that's an op that, today you can do that also. You can offload it to the DMA, which is the memory controller. You need to set it up, but still you exercise the bus. You, you save some overheads like over here. Uh, and you don't pollute the caches as much, that's good, but you're still off chip, right? It's basically a lot of work. And you also still interfere with other accesses coming from the CPU, right? While doing this copy, your bus is very busy. And if the CPU wants to access, yes, it can get some of its access through, but whenever uh, the memory scheduler gives that, gives that access to it. But there's a lot of downsides. Uh, but uh, if you actually use operational principles of memory, you can do this relatively easily inside the memory. And the, the idea is basically this, just do it inside memory without touching anything else in the system. Of course, you need to tell the memory to do this, right? And that's, again, you can offload, you can give that function to memory controller. But if you can do it completely inside memory, this is low latency because you don't need to go through it and you can exploit operational principles internally. Uh, this is low bandwidth utilization because you don't need to move any data over here. Again, no cache pollution, but you could eliminate that to the DMA. Uh, so DMA saves that part clearly. Uh, but the MA doesn't save this part. There's unwanted data moment on the bus uh, over here. But if you do it completely inside the memory, you get rid of unwanted data moment. And this unwanted data moment, as I said, is bad for energy, bad for performance of the application, and also bad for other applications running in the system, right? Other threads. So uh, basically, in DDR3 technology, but DDR4 and 5 are not that different, actually. You can reduce it a little bit, maybe. Uh, but uh, a four kilobyte page copy takes about 1,000 nanoseconds and 3.6 microjoules. Uh, according to our calculations in 2013, the, the role clone paper that I will mention. So if you do it completely inside memory, in the best case that I will show you, you basically can reduce it to 90 nanoseconds and 0 0.04 microjoules. And again, the idea is very simple. It's, uh, if you look at DRAM, uh, internally it consists of these subarrays, and the subarrays, you, you combine multiple subarrays to form a bank, and basically you have multiple banks in a chip, but the best you can do, in my opinion, is uh, to copy pages in a subarray. So assume that you have one row over here that needs to get copied to another row. The idea is to first activate the source row, which is essentially an activate command in DRAM, which brings the data into the sense amplifiers because each subarray has its own local sample amplifiers. That's the width of the row. You have to have this because you need to amplify the data in DRAM cells. DRAM cells 
are very small. Uh, whenever you activate a DRAM cell, it shares charge with the bit line over here, which is kind of shown, but not exactly shown. And then the sense amplifier amplifies that data and the sense amplifier size is more than 200 times the size of a cell basically today. So sense amplifiers are very strong actually, that's the row buffer. But today, today you can do this activate. What this activate transfers the row into the row buffer. Basically the idea in row clone is to use the row buffer as a temporary buffer to copy the data from this row to a destination row in the same suburbs. It's a very simple idea, as you can see. Yes. Aligned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, then, it, then this, form, this form doesn't work. There are other forms of row clone that enable you to copy uh, a, a byte, for example, from one row in this bank to another row in other banks. You, so you can do that. You can do arbitrary sizes if you go from one bank to another bank because you're using uh, the internal data bus in DRAM, uh, which is 64 bits, but it could be different values, of course. It's certainly not, uh, uh, let's say, four kilobytes or eight kilobytes, let's say. Yeah, uh, so here, for, for you to be able to do this copy, it needs to be aligned and it needs to be at this granularity. But we have some other proposals that basically change the granularity, as I will mention. Some of them may be on the list. I don't remember, actually. I don't think they're on the list, actually. But basically, the, the, the idea over here is, assuming you want to copy an entire row, from here to some other row in this subarray. Uh, the second step is to activate the destination row, which brings the data that was captured in the row buffer into the destination row. That's how it works. And this is purely based on the operational principles of DM. And people have shown that you could do it using uh, emerging memory technologies also. I will maybe mention one paper here. But uh, because of the operational principle of DM chart sharing, uh, the sense amplifiers drive the data back into uh, the cells because sense amplifiers are much stronger than the cells. Okay, so the idea is very simple basically. Two consecutive activates copy data from one row to another in the same subarray, and it's negligible hardware cost. You can use this for initialization also because if you think about initialization, initializing a one row to all zeros, let's say, it's a special case of copyright. You can, you can set one row to all zeros and copy that row uh, over to every row that you want to initialize. So initialization is always a special case of copy. Uh, okay, so it's negligible hardware cost to make it reliable, but it turns out uh, in existing systems, uh, you can violate the timing parameters in the DRAM controller such that two consecutive activates are very close to each other. And in, in many chips actually, uh, where you can actually violate the timing parameters today by changing the memory controller, uh, this works. Meaning uh, you can, we've actually tested, I'm gonna mention one of the papers that we have recently released, uh, we've actually tested chips where this actually simply works in real systems, even though the chips are not designed to support it, right? Nobody, uh, no DM manufacturer goes and advertise their chips to do this sort of copying, but you can see that chips fundamentally have this capability. So we wrote this paper in 2003, 2013, uh, and uh, later there was this paper at Micro in 2019, Compute DM, that showed that you can do it, and we actually tested it uh, in real DM chips, and we actually tested it, that it works. Of course, it doesn't work completely reliably because the chips are not designed to do it reliably. It's, fun, it's just that their fundamental operational principles allow it, us to do it. So if you go and design to be reliable, then it becomes much better, of course. Okay, so these are the benefits basically. So I'm not going to give you all of the details. If you're interested, you can read the row clone paper or we can talk in more detail uh, if needed. But you can see that the latency savings is significant and the memory energy savings are significant if you do this copy inside a subarray. Of course, uh, now uh, there are reasons why you may not want to, or you may not be able to do this copy inside the subarray. Uh, so in the paper, we argue that if, if, the sub, if the rows are, let's say the size of a page and the uh, operating system is aware of the subarray structure of DRAM, whenever it's doing copy on write, it can allocate the destination page that it's going to copy into from the same subarray, right? So this is another uh, example of potentially if you actually expose this information to the operating system, the operating system can do a much better job in allocating a page such that it can minimize the latency of this copy. And copy on write is a, very, a primitive that's used in forking, for example, and in other uh, cases in system. But your copies may not be always at the page granularity, they could be smaller granularity. Then you need to go through, let's say, interbank copy through this uh, bus inside the, Basically, you can copy data from one bank to another, 
by setting one bank to read mode and the other bank to write mode. And internally, there's already connections between these banks uh, anyway, because the, all of those banks need to connect to a shared bus to get the data out of the DM chip or get the data into the DM chip, into the bank. So these connections already exist mostly. You just need to orchestrate these connections so that one, one bank uh, can be in the read mode, another bank can be in the write mode, and the data can be sent from an inter, uh, an, an, a location in one bank to another location in another bank. And that's doable, basically. Uh, but that requires more modification to the DRAM circuit, clearly, and the uh, commands. This doesn't, uh, it's doable. It's not doable in existing DRAM, basically, off the shelf DRAM. And if you do that, then you still get, you can see that uh, performance and energy improvements. And uh, the worst case is when the subrace, uh, if you're in the same bank, because subrace are not connected to each other. So you have to copy the data to some other bank first, and then from that bank to the other subrace. But we actually have some solutions to this problem that I'm not going to uh, talk about. So. Uh, you can actually change the DRAM circuitry a little bit such that you add a little bit more connectivity between the subarrays so that you can do this copying between the subarrays more easily. We call this low cost interlinked subarrays. I don't know if I have, a, I, I have the paper over here. Looks like I don't have the paper in this version of the presentation at least. Uh, but you can uh, basically, if two subarrays are not connected to each other, the idea is why not connect them to each other with some isolation transistors, with simple transistors. And the cost of these are low. And it can basically reduce the latency to almost close to this red bar. It's not exactly clearly because you're not operating within the same subway, but it's, it's somewhere over here. So it's not bad, basically. And the energy is also commensurate. Okay, so that's the idea. The, the basic idea is in the stroke clone paper. Uh, and as I mentioned, more recently, we released this uh, infrastructure. This is paper is under review right now, but it's already on archive and the source code is out there also. Basically, what this infrastructure does is uh, it can enable you to do these operations in a real system. It's an FPGA, of course, right? FPGA is, uh, this FPGA uh, uh, is designed to change the memory controller for a given chip uh, so that you can do these operations, at least mostly reliably. <laughs> and then you can look at the system level effects of this and the paper has some numbers. If you're interested, you can take a look at it. So if you wanna play with an infrastructure where you can actually do this sort of processing using DRAM, you can do it right now with this infrastructure. It requires some work, of course, but you can do it. Okay. And I think some of you may be familiar with it. This is from Computer Architecture Fall 2021. So we cover a lot of this in computer architecture and a lot more. Okay. So I think, uh, any questions? Yes, please. Basically testing these new functions, right? You mean, or you mean for for this infrastructure, uh, or exactly, exactly, yes. Oh, no, no, we did that in simulation, basically. Yeah, yeah, we don't have DRM modules that we manufactured, basically. <laughs> Based on the principles, right? <laughs> yes, that, that's the, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, of course, if you really want to build a real system, you need to make sure you test it, validate it, et cetera, and then you make sure that way uh, to work. But based on the principles, there's no reason why it should not work, right? Because of the connectivity inside the, uh, between the banks and chips. And there, there's a lot of circuit simulations that you can do to also look at the tolerance to the variation in the circuit, etc. And those are, uh, that's how you can validate basically without building a chip. Of course, the next step is building a chip, but that's a huge, uh, at least in the DRAM space, building a chip is not easy today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Certainly, the stroke clone paper, uh, it was rejected once. I don't know if I have the uh, comments over here, but uh, yeah, I mean, people were not really, uh, people need to uh, uh, be in, the, in a good mindset, let's say, to really understand the impact of these papers, right? Uh, if they're of the mindset, oh, I cannot. So for example, one of the comments you receive if you do this kind of work is, DM manufacturers will never change their chips. That was one of the comments we received and the person said, reject, this is a reviewer. Clearly, this is a very bad review, right? It's, and it's a terrible mindset, right? Remember the book that we looked at? 
People will not change hardware. Yeah, it's uh, why change? It's working okay, right? That's the end of progress, basically. If, if a reviewer, scientific reviewer, starts saying something like this, I think it's terrible. Uh, and you cannot really, I mean, it's it's not a very, let's say, scientific comment. It's not. It's a very subjective comment in the end, right? It's, it's, it's nothing related to the proposal in the paper. The paper tries to show, okay, if you do this, this is the benefit. Our goal is not to basically speculate about whether DI manufacturers will change it or not. The goal is really to put out an idea that's not that was not out there before. And maybe someone will get inspired and they will change it. Who knows, right? But that's where the paper ends. Paper doesn't do that. So that's, that's one sort of criticism we got, for example. I don't know if I have the reviews. Let me see, actually. <laughs> if, if I, I mean, I don't have them in this version, but... Uh, actually, okay, this may be a right time to look at their use if people are interested. Is that a good use of our time? Okay, maybe. Let's see. I don't know if I have the right set of reviews, in fact. I cannot see anything. Can you see anything? Okay, you cannot see. <laughs> you see even less than I do right now. It was not the case earlier. Okay, it's certainly not in this presentation, apparently. So I'm going to stay in the slide and maybe try to share another presentation, hopefully without breaking stuff. Ah, uh, wrong one. Be the right one. Can you see it? Okay, good. So apparently I found it. <laughs> okay, I, I didn't cover Ambit, but I could. So basically this Rokon, uh, it's, as far as we know, the first example of minimally changing DRAM chips to perform data movement and computation. Uh, we were, I mean, uh, we were actually surprised that it was done as late as we did it, but we couldn't find any other work. Uh, it actually led to a body work in, uh, on in DRAM and in MVM computation with hopefully small changes. You will see that uh, in a little bit. And work building on this actually still continues. Uh, but initially it was rejected from the Cisco conference. It was published in the next conference. This is not the worst paper. This is not the paper uh, that was rejected the most times, basically. I'll put it that way. One, one time if you get it rejected, it's not bad. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay, maybe, uh, maybe this is not the best example of what I showed you earlier. Uh, yeah, okay, basically people, uh, okay, maybe these are not the best example of what I mentioned, but uh, I will mention one thing. So, uh, okay, Roquan is not the best example. Let's, let's go to Ambit. <laughs> I have a story here, but I think it's not necessary. Basically, reviewers base, uh, are, concerned about the applicability and uh, coherence issues that we discuss in the paper. Basically, they, they want solutions to other problems, right? Coherence, for example. Coherence is clearly a problem when you do this, uh, do some computation or data movement inside memory. But that's also a problem when you do the computation or data movement through the DMA, right? If you actually do the, uh, do the data copying through the DMA, uh, we argue in the paper that we don't need to change coherence. If you do it through the DMA like today, essentially you can get the benefits. Of course, minus the coherence overheads, right? That's the idea. That's discussed in the paper, but the reviewers don't like it for some reason. I don't remember why. Uh, and also, uh, this is another kind of uh, review you get if, you act, if your idea is actually simple like this. And for example, this, this reviewer says, the paper proposes a simple and not new idea, block copy in a DRAM and creates a blah, blah, complete system without providing any references. So this is actually very bad reviewing also, reviewing practice, because the reviewer says this is not new, but okay, on what basis do you say this is not new, right? And then we politely, so you usually get a chance to rebut the comments. Uh, we politely basically said, okay, this is not new. An explicit reference by the reviewer would be helpful here. While the reviewer may be referring to one of the patents that we cite in our paper, and there are actually many pot patents that kind of talk about something like this, but they never discuss what they use. These patterns are at a superficial level and they do not provide a concrete mechanism. In contrast, our paper provides three concrete mechanisms, basically. So you can see that one way people perceive the idea, right? Uh, and usually when you, when you propose a simple idea, uh, 
people dismiss it saying, oh, this is too simple. <laughs> that's actually not, uh, that's actually a feature, not a bug necessarily, right? The simple ideas are actually what makes a difference in general. And sometimes they say not new basically without providing any comments. So these are actually examples of bad reviews. I didn't put example of good reviews over here, unfortunately. So it was rejected from ISCA, even though it, was, it didn't have terrible reviews, let's say. Uh, you can see overall emeritus, I think, I don't know what three was, but it's, it was neutral. I think four was neutral over here in that particular case. But it, it got accepted to micro with much better reviews as you can see. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what the scale was. I mean, scale could be one to five. I don't remember, frankly. I have to go back and check. If the scale was one to five, that's not bad. Yeah, this is writing quality. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but different, different, uh, different columns may have different scales. Also, reviewer confidence are us is usually for well, again, it, it has different scales. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's uh, my guess is uh, this is from one to five. This may be from one to five also. I don't know. It's hard to guess. Usually, the uh, color of the green, how how bright it is, indicates that it's a higher score. So you can see that none of this is green over here. <laughs> <laughs> red is bad basically over here <laughs> okay so but after we published rocon actually after rocon was published this isca 2015 paper this is the paper that i mentioned from google right uh, they basically say uh, they they quantify the let's say they, what they call the data center tax in their data center workloads and they basically show mem move mem copy is the yellow portion over here you can see that the cycle in tax code about 5% of the overall cycles, basically. Oh, 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 this tax code, they say, for example, remote procedure calls are part of it. Protocol buffers are part of it. Hashing, allocation, compression. You can see that these functions are actually occupying a lot of overhead across, generally across many of their data center workloads. So accelerating compression could be a good idea, for example, as well. Uh, but in their paper, they said, recent work in performing data movement in DRAM, so I think the Rokulon paper, uh, could optimize away this piece of the tax which is the mem move mem copy tax, according to them. But this is after the paper is published, of course, right? So once the paper is published, actually it can have impact, but if the reviewers don't allow it to be published, then it may not have impact. So there's a lot that goes into writing a paper in a way that hopefully can get published. You do your best, but you cannot always control the reviewers, of course, right? And this doesn't mean that they don't always have, uh, they, they don't necessarily have uh, good feedback, right? In, in, in many cases, I received good feedback from reviewers also to improve the paper. In fact, in many cases, they accepted the paper and they said, oh, if you look at this and this and this, it'd be even better. And we always improve the paper at the end. So there's good feedback also, but sometimes, especially in some uh, areas that are kind of out of the field, uh, people may not be comfortable with, let's say, oh, the AI manufacturers will not change it. You will see those comments later on when we talk about Embit then you may actually get into this, a lot of rejections. Yes, you have a comment? Or? Oh. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes they're not experts. Sometimes they're experts. Uh, so they're usually chosen, at least in these conferences. Uh, conferences and journals have a different process. Uh, usually in computer architecture and in computer science in general, conferences are where cutting edge research gets published today. Tomorrow they may change, of course. Tomorrow, today actually, archive is becoming a lot more popular, right? People are putting their publication on archive before they send it to a conference or a journal, especially in uh, some areas. Uh, yeah. uh, if you have a conference, there is a program committee chair who assembles a program committee, and they basically assign the paper to program committee members. Uh, that's based on some criteria. <laughs> Usually it's a good idea to assign it to a diverse set of members to get more opinions. Uh, and usually expertise is a good idea, but not, uh, it's not always the case that experts review the paper, right? And experts reviewing a paper may be a double-edged sword also. It all depends on the mindset, right? An expert may be very close-minded. <laughs> yeah, they, because they know too much about the area and they may basically blurt out and say, okay, DI manufacturers will never do it. <laughs> And they may, there may be conflicts of interest that are not necessarily declared, right? For example, I mean, it's, it's, it's good to acknowledge these and not to do these, but I don't think everybody is on the same page. Uh, I think it's good to openly discuss these, but for example, you may be in, in industry, 
uh, and you may be invited to be a reviewer and you may not want the paper to be published because it competes with your product right this is real and this happens actually and you don't necessarily know why a person is rejecting a paper <laughs> they may put some other arguments the manufacturers will never implement it as a certain reason for rejection right i've seen this happen that's unfortunate but again it's a human process also right all human processes are uh let's say vulnerable to this sort of issues in the end and review process is another human process machines don't review the papers <laughs> yeah and machines are also biased as we know <laughs> right there's a lot of bias in the machines also so yeah i don't know how to fully fix it uh, fix the process in the end uh i mean you can also also put your paper on archive so that it can start immediately having impact right that's i think that's what is good today uh, this archive is very established, for example, or there are other venues like BioArchive, MedArchive, uh, and even other venues. But uh, they don't necessarily replace these, let's say, uh, top-notch conferences and venues because who's going to read all of those papers uh, that are put on archive by many people, right? Now, if you're established in the fields, field, then your papers are more likely to be read by people who respect your work, for example. That's a good thing, of course. Uh, that's the upside i think but of course if you're not established in the field yet how do you get those papers to be read uh, that's why these uh, publishing in these top venues are still uh, is still important right because it gives you visibility uh, to at least a broad set of people who are interested in this topic so yeah there's no good solution basically <laughs> okay so hopefully this gives you some insight into the review process and i think uh uh, the the Rod Jane paper, uh, the rat holes and those reasons for rejection apply very much into the review process as well. So let me talk about uh, some more on this, and then we can go back to the reviews for Ambit because that was a much more difficult process to get the paper accepted. Rocon was easier, although some uh, some experts were surprised that it was even rejected in the first place, basically, <laughs> because they think it's a it's an idea that should have been just obvious to get it in right away okay so pi dm we talked about so if you're interested in more actually we talk about this in the uh, computer architecture course also review process because we have a lot more time in that course uh, you can take a look at it but the mindset of uh, this sort of approach is having having an accelerator on the memory side so we just talked about an accelerator that's very good at accelerating copy and initialization operations right and i think this picture is to uh, mention that that mindset is important it can Basically, it can be a conventional accelerator, right? You're offloading to DMA today. Why not offload to the memory side, right? These copy initialization. Of course, memory side brings some more challenges. Yes, if you want to make, basically maybe make coherence a lot more efficient, now you have to go through the memory bus, right? Uh, which is a bandwidth bottleneck. Uh, but there, it, it also brings opportunities, right? Because now you're tightly coupled with memory. So your performance and energy efficiency can be much better. And I think the other point in this slide is we're building a lot of accelerators over here. They're, they're, they're going to be more and more and more and more. And all of these accelerators are bottleneck by memory, basically. <laughs> Why not consider some accelerators that are not bottleneck or not as much bottleneck uh, by the memory side over here? So that's the idea. Okay. So similarly, uh, we can support other operations, and I'm going to discuss how we can do uh, bitwise and or not and majority. I don't want to end the meeting. Okay. At low cost, uh, using analog computation capability inside DRAM. Again, we can use uh, principles uh, of DRAM. And the idea here is, uh, I mean, this is definitely uh, something that we couldn't find anywhere else before. Uh, not even at a very, let's say, uh, nebulous level. <laughs> People have not really talked about this as much. Basically, if you activate multiple rows concurrently, you perform computation. And this leads to a lot of performance energy improvements in these primitive operations, built block bitwise operations. And this was eventually published in 2017, but an earlier version that introduced block bitwise and an or, or was published in 2015, actually. I will mention that also. But this particular paper got rejected, for example, I think four times. And I will show you the reviews of this since you were uh, you guys were interested in it. So let's give, let's talk about the idea first. Oh, oh, what happened here? This is not my fault. Okay. Okay. There's definitely something going on here. <laughs> okay.
Okay, so uh, before I go into this particular idea, I should say that this idea and row clone are also applicable to new memory technologies. There is a paper, there are multiple papers that talk about it actually. And new memory technologies are these technologies, as you can see. And new memory technologies actually are even potentially stronger. I don't have these slides over here, but if needed, we can also go into that. Uh, so they can use these ideas that we talk about in DM. They can also do matrix vector multiplication because they're based on crossbar array. Uh, and you can, uh, you can basically store the weights inside a crossbar array, a memory array basically, and stream the uh, things that you're gonna multiply uh, with the weights. And then you basically get a matrix vector product in the end. I will talk about this maybe briefly if we have time. Are people interested in this? Okay, maybe I will jump into that after we talk about this ambit uh, based thing. So if you're really interested in this, you should take the computer architecture course. <laughs> That's what I would suggest. I think you have taken it, right? Is, is there anyone else? I don't recognize anyone else who's taken it. Yeah, we go into a lot of uh, detail in these topics. But basically emerging memory technologies also uh, operate based on similar principles, meaning you can take advantage of the operational principles of emerging memory technologies to do computation and data movement. But let's look at how we do this in DM. So this is in DM and in OR, or in DM majority, I should say. So if you look at DM, this is a bit line. These are three word lines. The idea is to concurrently activate three word lines at the same time. Assume that each word line is, let's say, eight kilobytes or four kilobytes, whatever it is. Uh, so you're doing this operation on four, a row at a time. Uh, so it's a block bitwise and an OR operation. And you could actually scale up by doing it in all of the subarrays of DM. Of course, you need to consider reliability issues. So, so you could do this in many millions of bits potentially at the same time. So that's, that's how, how parallel this operation can be. So what is the operation? Basically, as, as I said, triple row activation. We're looking at one bit over here. Uh, triple row activation means that you connect the capacitors to the bit line and based on circuit principles, uh, what you get is uh, the, the, the charge that you get out of these cells perturb the bit line, and if assuming an ideal circuit with not a lot of variation, uh, if at least two of these cells are charged, you get the charge state at the end. If at least two of these cells are discharged, you get the discharge state at the end. But just by that logical description, this is a bitwise majority function, right? Because you have three bits, A, B, C, and this is the bitwise majority function in Boolean form of those three bits. And uh, we did a lot of circuit simulations in the paper to show that in this paper, this is the first paper that talked about it actually, uh, to show that. And again, this is nice, bitwise majority is actually a very nice function. We will see that again in our later work, uh, but you can also express this at bitwise end and bitwise or. If C is one, you get the or of A and B. If C is zero, you get the end of A and B. That sounds nice now, right? So basically you can do bitwise end and or. And we actually show that if you can do it, uh, you can improve database performance. Uh, like bit, bit vector, there, there are a lot of uh, applications that operate on bit vectors, for example. Uh, and uh, this, this initial paper showed that you can actually improve that performance. You have a question? Okay, maybe later. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more. If you, have, if, you have, if you still have the question, we can discuss. So this is nice. Uh, what I don't show you over here is you can also do the knots. That's in the later paper, ambit paper. So basically, uh, again, Ambit paper is one of the papers that I proposed, I think, uh, I believe in the reading list. You can feel free to pick it up, pick it. If I'm, I don't remember if it was proposed, but something was proposed related to it, maybe SIMDRAM. So basically uh, the bit, the complement uh, of a row. So whenever you read a row in DRAM, you activate one row, you read C, right? Value. The complement value of, is here, right? This is a cross couple inverter. People who've taken digital design and computer architecture will re recognize that this is a cross couple inverter. It's a basic uh, cell that can store, uh, store data. And it stores the value here and the complement of the value here. So, and you can put that complement back into the array basically with some interconnection. That way you can actually uh, get the complement inside the subarray. That's a not operation basically. And you, uh, again, from digital design and computer architecture, if you have a not and end, you're functionally complete. Essentially you can build any, uh, logic out of this and you can as long as you can express your algorithm with this sort of block bitwise operations you can build any algorithm out of this yes please uh, 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 
So this is just an animation that shows that, okay, you, ch you share some voltage uh, and at some point you drive back the result. Uh, so you, you don't control that precisely, basically. The circuit, when you connect the capacitor uh, to the bit line, it basically loses some charge. Uh, it may lose all of the charge, basically. We don't know exactly how much it loses, actually. You can model it, but because of variation, you don't know exactly. It's not necessarily health. It gets close to health, for example. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, there's no specific voltage you need to control. That would be too precise, basically. Exactly. This is exactly. This is an absolutely analog operation. Basically, this is charge sharing is completely analog operation. Basically, we're doing a bitwise majority function in analog circuitry. Of course, it's not completely analog because we have the sense amplifier here that replenishes the charge and makes it reliable in the end. That's the upside. It's not completely analog operation in the end, but the fundamental principle is really analog. Yes. Yeah, so that's a great question, basically. We, we acknowledge that in the paper. There's, uh, yeah, because we're not reading the data out, we're not exercising any of the traditional error detection circuitry, right? You're doing completely inside, right, the DRAM. Uh, you need to add something extra to the DRAM to be able to detect the error. So we have not really looked at that, but we acknowledge as a challenge going into the future. If you want to really do error detection and correction, Whenever this operation happens, you need to do something about it. That's an open research question, actually. I'll mention one of the book chapters that we have written with uh, my student, Vivek Seshadri, who was the uh, essentially the first author of this work. And that's something we, that's something interesting, I think. Yes. Yeah, uh, I mean, yes, that's true. Uh, but today's DM is actually much smaller. So the capacitance is actually much lower in today's DM. But if you compare it to doing this operation as CPU, for example, uh, you, your energy is much better because you don't need to move the data, right? The data stays in the same subarray. And there's, of course, more detail right here. Uh, once this operation completes, uh, you destroyed all of the rows, right? So we actually propose a... Uh, simple modification to DRAM to do this operation, a special area in DRAM by, doing, by using row clone. So if you want to do this operation, there's only a special area in, a, in each subarray that you can move uh, the source rows to and then do this operation and then move the result back to, uh, a, let's say, main part of the subarray. And again, this is very much coupled with row clone. If you don't have row clone, this doesn't work as well. So row clone plus these operations uh, make it much more efficient. Okay, so there's, we discussed a lot of the paper in this particular slide, but we have a lot more detail uh, uh, if, uh, in, the, in the paper. And I don't want to kind of destroy it if it's on the list. <laughs> okay, so uh, where is this uh, beneficial? Clearly, as I said, if you have bulk bitwise operations in your algorithms and workloads, this can uh, benefit a lot. And databases use a lot of bulk bitwise operations. Uh, they're actually databases that are, I mean, bitmap indices, they don't have to be used for databases, for example, right? They could be used for other set operations, for example, uh, here uh, that I mentioned. Uh, but uh, they're, they're databases that are designed to maximize bitwise operations. This is called the bit weaving database. This was a paper that was published in 2013, I think, in a database conference. And their goal was to maximize bitwise operations so that uh, they can, because they, they, they think that these operations are simple and they can be accelerated with GPUs, for example, or potentially FPGAs. They don't look at FPGAs in that particular case. And they showed speed ups. So this is a very good fit, for example, for a substrate like Ambit because you're operating on millions of bits concurrently. Microsoft has a web search engine that operates on similar principles, maximizing bitwise operations. And there are other uh, algorithms that are quite bitwise, let's say. And the paper looks at several of these. And I think uh, perhaps the most end-to-end -end result is based on this database, bit weaving database. And, Essentially, I, I don't want to go into all that detail, but the paper has pr quite promising results. So you see four to 12 X performance improvement on execution time for queries, different queries in a database. And it's nice, I think. It's, uh, but it's not bad, basically. Clearly, this is not a real system that we implemented, the solar and simulation, but that's how ideas start. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is, so this is the first paper that we wrote. I'll 
tell you the I'll show you their use in a little bit. Not for this. This was actually accepted right away, but it's not. It's in a short paper basically that talks about the idea. Uh, and this is the paper that was published in Micro eventually, and you can you'll see their use soon. And more recently, we wrote this uh, book chapter with Vivek, and you can you can see we talk about some of the future research directions, which include error correction, for example. System design is another future direction. How do you actually enable a system uh, that can make this easier uh, to do? So maybe I can jump to use of this if people are interested, unless there are questions, technical questions on the topic. Okay, so let's talk about the reviews. I need to find them. I think it's in the other lecture that I opened up. Okay. Okay, you can see it hopefully. Okay, this is these are slides from computer architecture. So people who've taken the course, you can probably sleep if you want, or maybe have a different perspective. Hearing the same thing multiple times is not necessarily a bad thing, actually, from at least uh, the way I look at things. Uh, I always think differently. Uh, sometime later when I hear about the same thing. Uh, but basically, uh, this is my retrospective. This is, uh, essentially, this is really the first work on performing block bitwise operations in DRAM, ignoring our prior work, because prior work actually was a short paper. And uh, if, you, if you know how the community operates, uh, short papers from the same group are not really considered, let's say, uh, prior work that would limit publication at top conference, because if you think about the short papers, four pages, long papers, 12 pages, in at least computer architecture, or more 14 pages, 15 pages these days. Uh, so you need to actually have enough novelty on top of the short paper if you want to uh, have a top conference work. So basically, it exploits the analog computation capability of bit lines. And it extends and completes the Cal paper because in the, in the original paper, you just look at big, both bit buys and and or. I think that's not enough, clearly. It's, it still provides you benefit, but it's not as powerful as a functionally complete engine that can do not as well, right? So clearly it's disruptive, spans algorithms to circuits, devices, and we talk about that in the paper. It requires software, software hardware cooperation for adoption. You cannot just say, oh, I built the hardware. You need to actually adopt your algorithms to actually take advantage of it also. And it led to a large amount, in retrospect, it led to a large amount of work in similar approaches in DRAM and non-volatile memory. And the work continues to build actually, uh, I will mention. And as I said, initially it was dismissed by many reviewers. Uh, I guess I have the number right, rejected from four conferences. So let's take a look at them. So this is another set of reviews. This is the first uh, place it was submitted to ISCA 2016, it's a top conference. And you can see, uh, where is this? Overall merits, none of them are green. Well, I guess there's one green over here. <laughs> so it's all brown. Uh, yeah. It doesn't, yeah. This is another overall merit over here that doesn't look good, uh, but it's, it looks a bit better. Uh, Overall, somebody gave a one. One is really basically, I don't want to see this paper or over my dead body, you can reject, you can <laughs> get it in the, into this conference. We'll look at that to you. It's interesting. Interesting is an understatement. So you see another one, right? It, it attracts some strong feelings maybe somehow. <laughs> uh, but we'll see the reasoning of those feelings because it's not technical, let's say. Uh, so they don't basically find something wrong with the paper. They just dislike the idea. <laughs> But we'll see why that dislike is there. So you can see uh, it's a bit unlucky, right? But uh, oh, I don't show you the reject, uh, uh, accepted ones. You will see that it was accepted in the end. But basically, uh, these are some collection of the reviews. You can see that people actually say, one reviewer says, very clever, novel idea, great potential, speed up and efficiency gains, weaknesses. This is nothing we can do, right? We cannot do anything about this. This is not a scientific comment, basically, I would argue. Yes, you can make this comment, fine. You can say this, but this cannot be a basis of rejection, let's say. Because, yeah, how do you know about the future, right? This is, if, if you really want to make this a scientific comment, you have to prove this is the case. And I don't think anybody can prove it. But uh, it's very interesting. Uh, so future work uh, in micro 2019, basically showed that you can implement these operations in off-the-shelf DRAM chips by, again, modifying the timing controller parameters in memory controller. This is uh, two years after MBIT was published. They basically used the SoftMC infrastructure that we talked about in the last lecture, our infrastructure that enabled their research, which is great, I think. They basically showed that they were able to show that, uh, they, they were able to show existing, uh, uh, existing off-the-shelf DRAM chips can do 
these both bitwise and and or operations in a limited manner. Of course, it's limited because it's not perfect, right? The DRAM chips are not designed to be this way. You're messing up with the memory controller timings so that you're imitating triple row activation. And they explain it this way, basically. They, they change the timing such that they think what's happening is three rows are being activated at the same time. And you see an end function, end result, and an or result, depending on how you initialize the values, initialize one of the rows, of course. They cannot do not, of course, because not requires changes to the circuitry completely. Okay, so basically you can see that once an idea is published, it can inspire other people and other people can actually prove that idea can work. They can do a proof of concept basically. And maybe in the future, 10 years down the road, the yeah, manufacturers will do it. So you can see the reviewers may not be fair, right? How many people think this review is fair? I'm curious. How many people think this is unfair? Not that I want to bias you, but <laughs> okay, <laughs> somewhat unfair. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think this is an opinion basically, not necessarily. I mean, these are also opinions, uh, but I mean, you can clearly this is, uh, I mean, great part of his opinion, but the, the rest is demonstrated. Very clever novel idea. I think novel, at least uh, from the perspective of this uh, reviewer, it can be proven in some way, but this is not possible to prove, I think. <laughs> well, probably is actually mitigating it a bit, <laughs> but in the end, it's a reject. <laughs> Okay, this is also, uh, I think this is the same reviewer. I'm not sure. Yeah, basically I found this very interesting and novel. I'm not aware of any work that does something like this. Further, a huge degree of parallelism is unleashed, etc. The biggest problem is that it underestimates the difficulty in modifying the EM process for a benefit in only a subset of applications which do about pre operations. I find it hard to believe that the commodity DRAM industry will incorporate this into their standard DRAM process, blah, 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 blah. It's, I mean, all of this is true actually, but. This doesn't mean that ideas should not should be punished because this is how forward progress happens, right? A DM manufacturer may not be thinking about anything like this today, but 10 years down the road, they may be thinking about it. That's the beauty of science, I think. Okay, yeah. So you can read more. Again, another similar review, I would say. Uh, I think this was also a weak reject or something like that. This requires modification to DM that will only help this type of bitwise operation. It seems unlikely that something like this will be about it. Later work shows that you can actually do it for other uh, workloads also. Again, another, this will never get implemented. Okay, I don't wanna bore you with all of this. There's also this type of review, which is interesting. Uh, you can get this sort of review results. I do not find architectural innovation, even though the circus technique is good. So don't bother me, I'm an architect. I want to think this way. Uh, I don't wanna see anything else in my life, basically. So go to the circuits conference, basically, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. You, you mean you're surprised at this comment over here? Yeah, uh, I mean, it depends on the reviewer's perspective, I think that's a very good question. Uh, not everyone, right? Uh, for example, when I review papers, I try to look at the fundamental idea and the novelty. Implementation always comes as a second thing. Of course, sometimes it's important. If it's, if for example, it's not done uh, correctly, then there's a problem with the paper, right? But if it can be implemented, then in some way you can, they show that, then that's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I think it depends on the perspective of the reader. Some people uh, like to see papers that are immediately implemented. And they would, I would argue that they're not the right reviewers to review this sort of papers that clearly are not going to deliver that, right? So they're different kinds of papers. Uh, everything is heterogeneous and reviewers are also heterogeneous. I think uh, if, if your bright idea paper goes to a reviewer with, not, with the wrong mindset, you can certainly get rejected, right? I think this is true for other fields also, actually. It's not just in this area. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree with you. So you have the same mindset as me as a reviewer potentially, but not everybody uh, use this way, let's say. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. That's what they're suggesting here, right? The paper suits better to be peer reviewed and published in the circuit conference. 
or with a fabricated chip in ISSCC, which is another circuit conference that accepts papers that are only fabricated chips. Uh, uh, we, we eventually published an architecture conference, Micro. Uh, ISCA is also a similar quality architecture conference, I would say, but we published one year later. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that's... <laughs> No. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer. I don't, I, uh, there's no way to assure that, I think. I mean, there are some basic conflict of interest rules that are applied, but uh, for example, if I have co-authored with, my student cannot review my paper, for example, <laughs> uh, or I cannot review my student's paper or my advisor's paper uh, or collaborator's paper, but there are these hidden conflicts that are not really tracked or cannot be, I guess reasonably enforced, right? Yes. No, no, it's not as bad. Uh, basically, uh, the paper may get discussed. So sometimes it's usually based on the scores. If the scores are overall low, probably it's not going it, to. It doesn't get discussed. If some viewers argue for the paper, it may get discussed in a meeting. Usually, a meeting happens in some form, uh, and in that meeting, it can get discussed and. The viewer who wants to reject it may lose, for example, the argument somehow. Exactly, yeah, exactly. It's good, it's good. But, uh, I mean, uh, it can go anyway, right? So some, uh, some other viewers who actually like the paper, here, human factors come into play also, right? They may basically not be as persistent, for example, or they may say, okay, I'm gonna yield and let's, let this paper go or something like that, right? There, there are many human factors come into place. It depends on who their viewer is in the end. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit unfortunate. But I mean, that's why I think uh, if you remember that one, some of the slides, I said, you need to be resilient, right? If you, if you have an idea, you have to follow your passion and be resilient. And all of these are part of the resilience, in my opinion. If you want to do really research that changes the world, I think this is, there's no other way. Actually, I don't know if it's in this presentation. Maybe uh, I actually quote Einstein somewhere over here because he, was, he also had a lot of problems with the viewers. Once his paper was sent, he, he submitted this paper. I think this was when he went to America early uh, in early years. He submitted this paper uh, to a top journal at the time. And basically the journal came with, uh, a review or maybe two reviews, uh, came back with two reviews and uh, with a lot of, let's say, suggestions or uh, improvements. And Einstein said, uh, I didn't ask you to uh, review my paper. I asked you to publish my paper. <laughs> I mean, he basically withdrew the paper and submitted to another journal and it got published over there. <laughs> and I think, I mean, there's some, uh, uh, of course you may say this is arrogant, but I mean, it's good to, balance it right because uh yeah <laughs> not it's not uh sometimes you're operating at a level maybe some people may not really fully understand or appreciate that and there's a value if there's nothing wrong in the paper it may not make sense to reject it sometimes right if it's advanced to the state of the art okay let's take a look at this one uh okay okay this is very very funny actually you can see that this is a very strong reject right uh, okay, seems like a new idea. It's a bit sloppy. PIM ideas have researched. This is a very, uh, I think you can see from the writing that this is quite sloppy, right? And this paper is, is, he, is, is this person an expert? I don't remember. Passing familiarity, okay. Uh, hard to believe, yeah. It's, it's a very sloppy review, I would say, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't do a review like this. You can see that this reviewer says, impractical, too many implications on ISA, DRM design and coherence protocols, unlikely to benefit real world computations. Evaluation did not consider full program performance, which is wrong actually, the last one. Uh, the other ones are actually speculative because we clearly show real world computations in the paper. Impractical, okay, that's in the eye of the beholder in the end, right? Okay, so the funny part, the real funny part is, Okay, this is very subjective. I'm skeptical this would benefit real world computations. I've never seen real world program profiles with hot functions or instructions that are bitwise operations. Has anyone here seen bitwise operations or hot functions that do bitwise operations? How many? Okay, where have you seen it? Okay, in databases or, yeah. 
Encryption, exactly. Encryption is a great example, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Drivers, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think they're, yeah, they, this is actually <laughs> funny and sloppy and annoying at the same time, I would say this to you. <laughs> but the, the real funny part is actually coming. Uh, I mean, the rest you can criticize, of course, right? And I think it, uh, the other, uh, this is very interesting. On the other hand, I have seen system profiles that show non-trivial time zeroing pages. Suggest retooling your work to support page zeroing and evaluating that with a full system simulation. Take a look at when, why the Linux kernel zeroes pages. You might be surprised at this possible impact. Does this remind you of anything that we discussed in this lecture? Bro clone. It's all about zeroing and copying. So I found this dumbfounding that this reviewer basically is saying that do row clone. <laughs> it's a very yeah, funny and sad thing at the same time. Yeah, but we cannot control it. Uh, I mean, we responded to this reviewer, but again, it was rejected from HPCA 2017 since you don't see it in that conference. Okay, how do you respond to this reviewer is another issue. Clearly, we didn't do a good job because it was rejected or we didn't do a convincing job, but Maybe there's no way to do a convincing job to uh, convince a reviewer like this, right? Okay, the other one, this is also another interesting one. Uh, is this interesting or should we go back? <laughs> okay, maybe there's something you don't normally see in courses or anywhere, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think yeah, it should be done, but Okay, there are multiple explanations as to why that may not be done, right? The chair, the chair may be too busy. You're, he's, he or she is dealing with hundreds of papers. This may fall through the cracks, possibly. I guess I think paper, chairs should take more responsibility. Also, also you should take more responsibility to begin with so that chairs don't need to take that responsibility, but we're at the place where we are. Uh, or uh, the chair may see, yes, it's a bad review, but you know, they may not want to directly, yeah, uh, let's say, correspond to the reviewer. I like open reviews. I think reviewers should sign their reviews, right? I would like to see the reviewer sign their review and be proud of it. If they're proud of it, that's great, I think. <laughs> then I don't mind, actually. <laughs> and I'll let other people evaluate that reviewer based on that pride and this particular contents of the review. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. How did you notice that? Because buddy Ram, yeah, here. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. This was, this was purely based on our own initiative, actually. Actually, we put out an, after getting rejected twice, I think, uh, we put out an archive version of this on buddy Ram. And we felt Ambit was a nicer name, let's say. That's the reason, basically. You can find that archive version uh, of that paper. It's still called buddy Ram, and it's actually quite referenced as well. Uh, basically, before we were able to publish the paper, people built on the archive version of the paper. Yeah, we changed it was because it was more, let's say, representative and nicer. Accelerator in memory for bitwise operations, basically, ambit. <laughs> and also it has other meanings. <laughs> okay, that's a good, uh, you have a keen eye. <laughs> okay, let's see this last one, since you're still interested in this. Uh, yeah, now I cannot read it, so I have to read this part. So basically, uh, you can see that this review is an expert. This is my area. Uh, yeah, reject. Uh, okay, conceptually very interesting, but practically not sure. Consider various aspects, including the interaction between processors and RAM, blah, blah. Negative impact on the regularity of the MRA design and associated already evaluation seems to be very weak, significantly increase the testing cost. Okay, I mean, you can always find some holes, right? Clearly, we cannot evaluate any testing cost as easily, right? But we acknowledge things like that. Uh, yeah, so basically evaluation, especially to circuit level issues. You could argue whether or not that's true. Yeah, there's a lot of comments over here, but I don't know if this really re re uh, deserves a strong reject after all of that, right? Depends on your perspective. So another uh, review, I think it's a weak reject, as you can see, it's not an expert. Again, this is all self-proclaimed, right? We don't know if this is uh, correct or not. Uh, yeah, not motivated. Okay, you can see that <laughs> there are a bunch of things over here. 
So the summary is interesting, actually. Uh, yeah, you can read this. I don't know if I have anything over here. But basically, it's nitpicking on uh, evaluation issues, I would say. It's not seeing the potential of the idea, but nitpicking on, okay, here, 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 et cetera. Some things we cannot even evaluate, right? The potential reliability issues that arise due to the lack of ECC mechanisms, for example, it was mentioned earlier. And this is something, I mean, a paper, basically my, my perspective is a paper does not need to solve everything in the world uh, related to an idea. Uh, as long as the idea is promising and it, there's nothing wrong in the paper, then perhaps uh, let, it, let it really start having impact in the world, right? And this is not clear, that's not, the, this reviewers don't, these reviewers don't seem to agree, yes. This one? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what we did in the rebuttal that <laughs> annoyed us through you were basically. It may be based on the discussion. It may be based on, I don't know. It may be that he, uh, this, this person really wanted to reject the paper and they put a weak reject in the beginning. And then they saw oh, maybe there are some people who are really going to accept the paper. So let me lower it to <laughs> reject. So there are many, many things that go into it, right? Not just technical issues, basically. That's a good point. I have to go and look at the rebuttal, which I don't necessarily want to do, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you can... Uh, yeah, so basically you can see that there, there are questions like this, right? What happens if both operands are located in one row? Then it doesn't work, right? It's kind of obvious, right? There's, there's, it's not... This is like asking... Uh, uh, how, do I, how do I find a good analogy? Uh, I don't know, maybe you guys can find a better analogy than I do at this point, but this is like asking, uh, how do you uh, execute a database on your machine learning accelerator, right? <laughs> I built this machine learning accelerator, don't ask me about the database, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's the same level of question, I think. Okay, so, okay, you can see that these are all uh, nitpicking issues. Okay, in the end, the paper was published in uh, Micro, and we acknowledge all of these people, <laughs> other, other conferences who reviewed the paper. And this is the publication at Micro. You can see there's still people uh, who want the paper rejected, right? But maybe they're not as persistent. Yeah, that's why I recommend this book to everyone. Well, this is not the, I was recommending this book before, but you can see, you can actually find a lot of the rejection reasons in this particular picture. Workload. What if my operands are located in the same row? Your workload doesn't fit. Change your workload. Come on, that's that's what we argue in the paper, right? Change your write your algorithm so that you can benefit from it, right? Okay, you may not like that, but there are a lot of people who do that, right? For GPUs, people have done it for, in in very primitive stages of the GPUs, right? Machine learning accelerators, people are doing that today. Metrics. I don't think anybody worried about the metrics, but configuration detail, like experiments, right? These these nitpicky issues about experiments. Okay. There's, there's no end to it, basically. These are real red holes. And I think white change working okay, you can also see that, right? <laughs> DM manufacturers will never do it. So that's why I actually said, uh, I actually uh, talk about this publicly in our community also. Uh, this is what I say, basically. In the end, uh, we're all humans. We do not know it all, right? So you need to be fair. You need to be open-minded. You need to be accepting of different diverse research methods, right? Just because I'm not doing research like that, doesn't mean that I should be against research like that, right? I should be much more open. And there is no single way of doing research or writing papers. Some papers are completely theoretical. Some papers are completely practical and they all have different values. As long as provide new insights, they all have value, right? And I think this is important. And yeah, I think this goes into the double standards, which is really these conflict of interest potentially, right? But in the end, I think, uh, actually, I actually see, it's not just my papers, clearly it affects me the most if it's our papers, right? Our research group papers, but I see a lot of other papers also potentially getting rejected. And in the end, what's happening is blocking or delaying scientific progress for non reasons, right? Okay, so just like main memory needs intelligent controllers, research community needs accountable reviewers. <laughs> I use these slides somewhere. Uh, maybe there's something else over here that I, okay, yeah, this is the compute DM paper that I mentioned. Uh, these folks show that you can actually do row clone and ambit and then or operations using off the shelf DRAM chips. And they actually explain, uh, at least hypothesize why this happens by reducing the timing constraints. Uh, and yeah, I don't wanna go into it right now, but you can see that since we didn't really go into, into detail in ambit as well. Okay, so 
basically they did it on real systems and they, they have a proof of concept on soft MC as we discussed. Okay, yeah, that's why I see all of this. And if you want to, oh, I don't have it over here. Okay, anyway. Okay, so that was a big <laughs> aside. Any questions on this? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Really? Is that? Uh, once getting on a rejected or accepted? Uh. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So normally we try to address every single comment we received, uh, if it, as long as, as far as it's addressable, basically. So there's some time between acceptance and camera ready, yes. You can, uh, the goal, uh, in my opinion, and this is how science should work, in my opinion, right? You get comments and you should address them and improve the paper as much as possible. Even after it's published, I would argue, because today we have archive, right? If you find something that can be improved in your paper, you can keep updating the archive version online. And all of them get, uh, you can find all of the versions of the paper online also on archive. Well, <laughs> if you complete, uh, of course, I mean, if you completely change the rewrite the paper and change the idea, maybe potentially, right? But that doesn't, uh, the hope is that nobody does that, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. So if you look at, for example, Buddy Ram, you, feel, you're, you can feel free to read it. I don't think much changed actually. Uh, evaluation, yes. Uh, paper is written better. Some, some parts have been changed uh, to address the comments, certainly. But I don't, the key idea is still the same, basically, triple row activation. That's not, that does not change at all. So if you, one could argue that fundamental idea, fundamental thing that will make a difference down the road 20 years, potentially, if it's going to make the difference, that doesn't change. Well, that's the, maybe that's what they accept, but that's the review process it has a lot of other things that it puts into, right? To potentially accept that idea, right? And that's a very inefficient process in my opinion, right? Because you waste time of the authors, waste time of the reviewers. Maybe there should be a better way, but I don't know what that better way is. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Oh, I see. Uh, but yeah, you mean the co-authors? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so uh, they're, they're co-authors because they are working on the idea and they will like the idea. Uh, in the end, their perspective is, uh, yes, it may not be immediately implementable like today, right? But who knows 10 years down the road, right? Because it's always, with, th with that sort of argument, uh, you never know what will get implemented, right? Because trade-offs change uh, and uh, the benefits change, uh, the relative effect of workloads change and industry may be very open to implementing it 10 years down the road. Like we discussed with processing in memory, right? Processing in memory became, let's say, much more interesting to industry recently because trade-offs have changed a lot. We're kind of squeezed in the middle, right? And same arguments, similar arguments have been made for for example, our processing in memory papers, right? Some, we, we did, a, did an accelerator for graph processing. I think we discussed it last time. Today, uh, people would say industry would not put processors inside their memory chips, but we already see that. Uh, I mean, okay, maybe not full-blown processors, but people have changed. For example, SK Hynix, GDDR6 AIM accelerator in memory has a substantial area uh, inside their DRAM chip. So we clearly see that industry is implementing ideas. But yeah, the, the co-authors clearly don't think that way. That's why they're co-authors. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that, I mean, they should really. Uh, so everybody has different amounts of contribution. Usually, the first author makes the biggest contribution, right? Uh, and uh, the advisors usually make big contributions. Clearly, co-authors. They may help with the ideas, development of the ideas. They may help with the experiments. They may help with the 
writing of the paper. So there are different, uh, yeah, different ways of actually being a co-author, let's say. Yeah, does that make sense? There's no, let's say, single criterion. I mean, as a co-author, basically, in, in my opinion, like my perspective of a co-author is like, uh, you should really be involved in everything in the paper as much as possible, of course. It's not always possible. You should really uh, read and completely approve the paper completely. And, uh, and also, uh, it's good to own the paper, of course, right? This is my paper. Uh, and uh, let's say uh, I watch for the validity and goodness of it, let's say, right? I think that's a, that's a good function of a co-author. If you cannot do any of those, maybe you shouldn't be a co-author, right? <laughs> or if you cannot do one of those. That's what I would argue. But again, I didn't really formulate these rules. I'm, uh, I'm making an answer on the, uh, providing an answer on the fly right now. Okay. Anything else? This seems like a very interesting topic for many people. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so there, uh, how does it how does it affect the paper publication? You mean or? Yeah, I, I think open sourcing is actually very good in my opinion, uh, so that your work can have impact. Uh, how does it affect paper publication? So uh, sometimes you can open source before you publish your paper, and then write a paper about it. This this is sometimes difficult because uh, in major conferences the review process is double blind, meaning you don't put your name when you write the paper. Reviewers don't know the authors and the authors don't know the reviewers. That's what double blind means. Now, if you've open sourced your work and you're describing uh, the work that's open sourced, uh, it's, it puts you in a difficult position as an author, right? How do you basically hide your identity? It's kind of unnatural, right? You've already done the work, you're trying to explain it. It's open source, it's having impact, but you have to stay blind, uh, meaning you, you should not expose your identity uh, to the viewers. It's a very difficult position, I think. That's a bit bad, I think. That, uh, that's one argument against double blind submissions, I would say. Uh, but there are benefits to double blind submissions also. Potentially, it could lead to more fair reviewing, right? Although <laughs> you could argue that there are other issues with fair reviewing also. Uh, so that's one aspect. I, I, in general, like open sourcing. For example, this PyDM paper, we open sourced uh, before we submitted it, but we didn't send it to a venue that's double blind. It was single blind, meaning authors were visible, but we don't know their reviewers. There are venues like that. Journals are like that usually. Uh, but uh, after, okay, you can open source after it's published. Uh, I think in general, that's good if you can do it. If, if you're not bound by NDAs, for example, then I think that's good. That's what we usually do, for example, in our research. We, we try to open source as much as possible uh, that's published. And I think, uh, I don't think there's any uh, reviewing related issues over there. Uh, for patents, uh, so in my research, in our research, we don't do any patents, basically. I don't, uh, I don't believe that academia should be patenting uh, things necessarily. Sometimes industry makes you annoyed that you should really be patenting, but <laughs> that's a different issue. Uh, if especially if industry, so there's this, uh, I think academia certainly gets a lot of, let's say, uh, funding from the public, right? And, uh, and ideally academia, in my opinion, should not uh, be patenting and uh, let's say suing the companies uh, for, for, think, for ideas out there. I think everybody should be free to use the ideas uh, because, well, maybe I'm idealistic, uh, but because in, I don't see that as academia's function. Uh, but I think this also assumes that industry is nice to academia as well, right? If they, if they benefit from something, they should really invest into academia and they shouldn't just suck the talent out of the academia and uh, make profit out of it. You see what I mean? So that's my perspective on patenting. And I see th that kind of industry a lot, actually, sucking the talent out of the academia, getting the best students, getting the products and not injecting, uh, let's say, funding uh, maybe they cannot inject uh, their cutting edge trade secrets, fine, but at least they should inject funding to enable people to uh, really make progress and also uh, enable them to uh, educate the talent, right, in the end. Uh, 
yeah, so uh, yeah, there, there could be other perspective in this patenting. If you open source, that doesn't mean that you cannot patent, right? Uh, you, you, you can patent an idea, uh, and then you open source it after you file the patent. No problem. You can write a paper also. And there's usually a window of time. You may submit a paper, and within some time, you can still submit the patent. Yeah. So open sourcing is orthogonal, I would say, to patenting. Yes, please. I see. I see. I, yeah, yeah, you can, you can, you can do that. Yes, basically, you can open source and then uh, create a double a blind mirror. Let's say anonymized mirror of the repository and use that in the paper. Maybe rename some things. Yeah, it's a lot of effort, though, right? It's unnatural. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Exactly. That's the benefit of open sourcing early, right? You can get input, you can improve the work, improve the tools, etc. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, potentially. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I guess it depends on the work, right? Once you publish, that doesn't mean that open source can, can stop, right? For example, I think uh, from our experience, we, uh, we published a Ramulator paper, which is a DRAM simulator. It's having a lot of impact on industry and academia. People are using it and we're still working on it, fixing bugs. Uh, and we have a new version coming up in the next couple of months, hopefully. So I think it depends in the end, yes. I, I don't think it's the case that once you publish the paper, the open source work will stop. But I think, the, uh, yes, the earlier the open source, uh, you can get more feedback and the work will have more, uh, will start having impact earlier, I think. Uh, you're not supposed to type into Google and search for the paper. <laughs> but if you search for, let's say, related work. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you try to find its novel, you can find the. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but then it's. Not... Yeah, exactly. I think there's a whole mess, basically. I think open source is similar, actually. For example, if you want to open source on GitHub and make it available to everyone, how do you anonymize it afterwards? Do you remove it? I think there are problems over there, right? Uh, you can, you still cannot completely remove it, right? Yeah, I think basically this, uh, there's a tension between double blind and let's say quick, uh, uh, how do I say, expo exposition of the ideas to the public. And this tension is real. As, as Constantino said, yes, it's true for preprints on archive also. Yeah, that's why I think perhaps open review process is nice, right? Just submit it, then people know the authors, people know their viewers. All of the comments are online. Hopefully, viewers will not make remarks like this because they may get challenged, right? <laughs> By the community, not necessarily just the authors. And, and they have something at stake, right? I think, I think, uh, I mean, uh, the, the issue with their use that I see, frankly, is their viewers have nothing at stake at this point. They basically have no zero accountability. And they can write anything they want. They may not even have read the paper. I've seen those cases also. And some other reviews you may, if we discuss more reviews, you may see it. So this accountability is a big problem. I mean, whenever there is no accountability, then there's corruption, right? I think you see it in all aspects of the world. <laughs> and whenever mechanisms to, uh, even though there may be mechanisms to enforce accountability, and if they're not employed, then again, corruption starts right okay but this is no reason to let's say despair because there's a lot of impact to be had i think in the end if you really uh, 
follow your passion and really be resilient, I think can have a lot of impact. Okay, I think we've already, we're already over time. Well, we discussed this a lot. So what do you want to do next week, quickly, maybe? Continue with in-memory computing or switch to some other topic or finish this and then switch to some other topic? Okay, maybe we'll finish this and then switch to some other topic next week. Okay, take care. See you next week. Don't forget to uh, prioritize your papers. Okay. Yeah, sure. Oh, okay.